Section One of the Courtship of Miles Standish. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wilson. The Courtship of Miles Standish by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Part One Miles Standish. In the old colony days in Plymouth, the land of the pilgrims, to and fro in a room of his simple and primitive dwelling, clad in doublet and hose and boots of cordovan leather, strode with a martial air Miles Standish, the Puritan captain. Buried in thought, he seemed, with his hands behind him, and pausing ever and anon to behold his glittering weapons of warfare, hanging in shining array along the walls of the chamber. Cutlass and corslet of steel, and his trusty sword of Damascus, curved at the point, and inscribed with its mystical Arabic sentence, while underneath in a corner were fowling piece, musket, and matchlock. Short of stature he was, but strongly built and athletic, broad in the shoulders, deep-chested, with muscles and sinews of iron. Brown as a nut was his face, but his russet beard was already flaked with patches of snow, as hedges sometimes in November. Near him was seated John Alden, his friend and household companion, writing with diligent speed at a table of pine by the window. Fair-haired, azure-eyed, with delicate Saxon complexion, having the dew of his youth, and the beauty thereof, as the captives whom St. Gregory saw and exclaimed, Not angles, but angels! Youngest of all was he of the men who came in the Mayflower. Suddenly breaking the silence, the diligent scribe interrupting, spake in the pride of his heart, Miles Standish, the captain of Plymouth. Look at these arms, he said, the warlike weapons that hang here, burnished and bright and clean, as if for parade or inspection. This is the sword of Damascus I fought with in Flanders. This breastplate, well, I remember the day, once saved my life in a skirmish. Here in front you can see the very dent of the bullet fired point-blank at my heart by a Spanish arcabucero. Had it not been of sheer steel, the forgotten bones of Miles Standish would at this moment be mould, and their grave in the Flemish morasses. Thereupon answered John Alden, but looked not up from his writing, Truly the breath of the Lord hath slackened the speed of the bullet. He in his mercy preserved you to be our shield and our weapon. Still the captain continued, unheeding the words of the stripling, See how bright they are burnished, as if in an arsenal hanging. That is because I have done it myself, and not left it to others. Serve yourself, would you be well served, is an excellent adage. So I take care of my arms, as you of your pens and your inkhorn. Then, too, there are my soldiers, my great invincible army, twelve men, all equipped having each his rest and his matchlock, eighteen shillings a month, together with diet and pillage, and, like Caesar, I know the name of each of my soldiers. This he said with a smile that danced in his eyes as the sunbeams dance on the waves of the sea and vanish again in a moment. Alden laughed as he wrote, and still the captain continued. Look! You can see from this window my brazen howitzer planted high on the roof of the church. A preacher who speaks to the purpose, steady, straightforward, and strong, with irresistible logic. Orthodox, flashing conviction right into the hearts of the heathen. Now we are ready, I think, for any assault of the Indians. Let them come if they like, and the sooner they try it, the better. Let them come if they like, be it Sagamore, Sachem, or Powwow, Aspinet, Samoset, Corbettant, Squanto, 
a Tokamahaman. Long at the window he stood and wistfully gazed on the landscape, washed with a cold gray mist, the vapory breath of the east wind, forest and meadow and hill, and the steel blue rim of the ocean lying silent and sad in the afternoon shadows and sunshine. Over his countenance flitted a shadow like those on the landscape, gloom intermingled with light, and his voice was subdued with emotion, tenderness, pity, regret, as after a pause he proceeded. Yonder there on the hill by the sea lies buried Rose Standish, beautiful rose of love that bloomed for me by the wayside. She was the first to die of all who came in the Mayflower. Green above her is growing the field of wheat we have sown there. Better to hide from the Indian scouts the graves of our people, lest they should count them and see how many already have perished. Sadly his face he averted, and strode up and down, and was thoughtful. Fixed to the opposite wall was a shelf of books, and among them prominent three, distinguished alike for bulk and for binding. Bariff's Artillery Guide, and the Commentaries of Caesar, out of the Latin translated by Arthur Golding of London, and as if guarded by these, between them was standing the Bible. Musing a moment before them, Miles Standish paused, as if doubtful which of the three he should choose for his consolation and comfort whether the wars of the Hebrews, the famous campaigns of the Romans, or the artillery practice designed for belligerent Christians. Finally, down from its shelf he dragged the ponderous Roman, seated himself at the window, and opened the book, and in silence turned o'er the well-worn leaves, where thumb-marks thick on the margin, like the trample of feet, proclaimed the battle was hottest. Nothing was heard in the room but the hurrying pen of the stripling, busily writing epistles important to go by the Mayflower, ready to sail on the morrow, or next day at latest, God willing. Homeward bound with the tidings of all that terrible winter, letters written by Alden, and full of the name of Priscilla, full of the name and the fame of the Puritan maiden Priscilla. End of Part 1 of The Courtship of Miles Standish Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Section 2 of The Courtship of Miles Standish by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson Part 2 Love and Friendship Nothing was heard in the room but the hurrying pen of the stripling, or an occasional sigh from the laboring heart of the captain, reading the marvelous words and achievements of Julius Caesar. After a while he exclaimed, as he spoke with his hand palm downwards heavily on the page, A wonderful man was this Caesar! You are a writer, and I am a fighter, but here is a fellow who could both write and fight, and in both was equally skillful. Straightway answered and spake John Alden, the comely, the youthful. Yes, he was equally skilled, as you say, with his pen and his weapons. Somewhere have I read, but where I forget, he could dictate seven letters at once, at the same time writing his memoirs. Truly, continued the captain, not heeding or hearing the other, truly a wonderful man was Caius Julius Caesar. Better be first, he said, in a little Iberian village, than be second in Rome. And I think he was right when he said it. Twice was he married before he was twenty, and many times after. Battles five hundred he fought, and a thousand cities he conquered. He too fought in Flanders, as he himself has recorded. Finally he was stabbed by his friend, the orator Brutus. Now do you know what he did on a certain occasion in Flanders, when the rear-guard of his army retreated, 
the front giving way too and the immortal twelfth legion was crowded so closely together there was no room for their swords why he seized a shield from a soldier put himself straight at the head of his troops and commanded the captains calling on each by his name to order forward the ensigns then to widen the ranks and give more room for their weapons so he won the day the battle of something or other that's what i always say if you wish a thing to be well done you must do it yourself you must not leave it to others all was silent again the captain continued his reading nothing was heard in the room but the hurrying pen of the stripling writing epistles important to go next day by the mayflower filled with the name and the fame of the puritan maiden priscilla every sentence began or closed with the name of priscilla till the treacherous pen to which he confided the secret strove to betray it by singing and shouting the name of priscilla finally closing his book with a bang of the ponderous cover sudden and loud as the sound of a soldier grounding his musket thus to the young man spake miles standish the captain of plymouth when you have finished your work i have something important to tell you uh, be not however in haste i can wait i shall not be impatient straightway alden replied as he folded the last of his letters pushing his papers aside and giving respectful attention speak for whenever you speak i am always ready to listen always ready to hear whatever pertains to miles standish thereupon answered the captain embarrassed and culling his phrases tis not good for a man to be alone say the scriptures this i have said before and again and again i repeat it every hour in the day i think it and feel it and say it since rose standish died my life has been weary and dreary sick at heart have i been beyond the healing of friendship oft in my lonely hours have i thought of the maiden priscilla she is alone in the world her father and mother and brother died in the winter together i saw her going and coming now to the grave of the dead and now to the bed of the dying patient courageous and strong and said to myself that if ever there were angels on earth as there are angels in heaven two have i seen and known and the angel whose name is priscilla holds in my desolate life the place which the other abandoned long have i cherished the thought but never have dared to reveal it being a coward in this though valiant enough for the most part go to the damsel priscilla the loveliest maiden of plymouth say that a blunt old captain a man not of words but of actions offers his hand and his heart the hand and heart of a soldier not in these words you know but this in short is my meaning i am a maker of war and not a maker of phrases you who are bred as a scholar can say it in elegant language such as you read in your books of the pleadings and wooings of lovers such as you think best adapted to win the heart of a maiden when he had spoken john alden the fair-haired taciturn stripling all aghast at his words surprised embarrassed bewildered trying to mask his dismay by treating the subject with lightness trying to smile and yet feeling his heart stand still in his bosom just as a timepiece stops in a house that is stricken by lightning thus made answer and spake or rather stammered than answered such a message as that i am sure would i, I should mangle and mar it if you would have it well done i am only repeating your maxim you must do it yourself you must not leave it to others but with the air of a man whom nothing can turn from his purpose gravely shaking his head made answer the captain of plymouth truly the maxim is good and 
I do not mean to gainsay it, but we must use it discreetly and not waste powder for nothing. Now, as I said before, I was never a maker of phrases. I can march up to a fortress and summon the place to surrender, but march up to a woman with such a proposal, I dare not. I'm not afraid of bullets, nor shot from the mouth of a cannon, but of a thundering no, point-blank from the mouth of a woman, that I confess I am afraid of, nor am I ashamed to confess it. So you must grant my request, for you are an elegant scholar, having the graces of speech and skill in the turning of phrases. Taking the hand of his friend, who still was reluctant and doubtful, holding it long in his own and pressing it kindly, he added, Though I have spoken thus lightly, yet deep is the feeling that prompts me. Surely you cannot refuse what I ask in the name of our friendship. Then made answer John Alden, The name of friendship is sacred. What you demand in that name, I have not the power to deny you. So the strong will prevailed, subduing and molding the gentler. Friendship prevailed over love, and Alden went on his errand. End of section two of the courtship of Miles Standish, recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section three of the courtship of Miles Standish by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Part three, the lovers errand. So the strong will prevailed, and Alden went on his errand, out of the street of the village, and into the paths of the forest, into the tranquil woods, where bluebirds and robins were building towns in the populous trees, with hanging gardens of verdure, peaceful, aerial cities of joy and affection and freedom. All around him was calm, but within him commotion and conflict love contending with friendship, and self with each generous impulse. To and fro in his breast his thoughts were heaving and dashing, as in a foundering ship with every roll of the vessel washes the bitter sea the merciless surge of the ocean. "'Must I relinquish it all?' he cried with a wild lamentation. "'Must I relinquish it all, the joy, the hope, the illusion?' Was it for this I have loved and waited and worshipped in silence? Was it for this I have followed the flying feet and the shadow over the wintry sea to the desolate shores of New England? Truly the heart is deceitful, and out of its depths of corruption rise like an exhalation the misty phantoms of passion. Angels of light they seem, but are only delusions of Satan." All is clear to me now. I feel it. I see it distinctly. This is the hand of the Lord. It is laid upon me in anger, for I have followed too much the heart's desires and devices, worshipping Astaroth blindly and impious idols of Baal. This is the cross I must bear, the sin and the swift retribution. So through the Plymouth woods John Alden went on his errand, crossing the brook at the ford where it brawled over pebble and shallow, gathering still, as he went, the mayflowers blooming around him, fragrant, filling the air with a strange and wonderful sweetness, children lost in the woods and covered with leaves in their slumber. "'Puritan flowers,' he said, "'and the type of Puritan maidens, modest and simple and sweet,' the very type of Priscilla, so I will take them to her, to Priscilla, the May flower of Plymouth, modest and simple and sweet, as a parting gift will I take them, breathing their silent farewells as they fade and wither and perish, soon to be thrown away, as is the heart of the giver. So through the Plymouth woods John Alden went on his errand, 
came to an open space and saw the disk of the ocean, sailless, somber, and cold, with the comfortless breath of the east wind, saw the new-built house and people at work in a meadow, heard as he drew near the door the musical voice of Priscilla singing the hundredth psalm, the grand old Puritan anthem, music that Luther sang to the sacred words of the psalmist, full of the breath of the Lord, consoling and comforting many. Then, as he opened the door, he beheld the form of the maiden, seated beside her wheel, and the carded wool like a snowdrift piled at her knee, her white hands feeding the ravenous spindle, while with her foot on the treadle she guided the wheel in its motion. Open wide on her lap lay the well-worn psalm-book of Ainsworth, printed in Amsterdam, the words and the music together, rough-hewn angular notes like stones in the wall of a churchyard, darkened and overhung by the running vine of the verses. Such was the book from whose pages she sang the old Puritan anthem. She, the Puritan girl, in the solitude of the forest, making the humble house and the modest apparel of homespun beautiful with her beauty, and rich with the wealth of her being. Over him rushed like a wind that is keen and cold and relentless thoughts of what might have been, and the weight and woe of his errand. All the dreams that had faded, and all the hopes that had vanished, all his life henceforth a dreary and tenantless mansion, haunted by vain regrets and pallid sorrowful faces. Still, he said to himself, and almost fiercely he said it, let not him that putteth his hand to the plough look backwards. Though the ploughshare cut through the flowers of life to its fountains, though it pass o'er the graves of the dead and the hearths of the living, it is the will of the Lord, and his mercy endureth for ever. So he entered the house, and the hum of the wheel and the singing suddenly ceased. For Priscilla, aroused by his step on the threshold, rose as he entered, and gave him her hand in signal of welcome, saying, I knew it was you when I heard your step in the passage, for I was thinking of you as I sat there singing and spinning. Awkward and dumb with delight that a thought of him had been mingled thus in the sacred psalm that came from the heart of the maiden, silent before her he stood and gave her the flowers for an answer, finding no words for his thought. He remembered that day in the winter, after the first great snow, when he broke a path from the village, reeling and plunging along through the drifts that encumbered the doorway, stamping the snow from his feet as he entered the house, and Priscilla laughed at his snowy locks, and gave him a seat by the fireside, grateful and pleased to know he had thought of her in the snowstorm. Had he but spoken then, perhaps not in vain had he spoken. Now it was all too late. The golden moment had vanished. So he stood there abashed, and gave her the flowers for an answer. Then they sat down and talked of the birds and the beautiful springtime, talked of their friends at home, and the mayflower that sailed on the morrow. "'I have been thinking all day,' said gently the Puritan maiden, "'dreaming all night and thinking all day of the hedgerows of England. They are in blossom now, and the country is all like a garden, thinking of lanes and fields and the song of the lark and the linnet, seeing the village street and familiar faces of neighbors, going about as of old and stopping to gossip together. And at the end of the street the village church, with the ivy climbing the old gray tower and the quiet graves in the churchyard. Kind are the people I live with, and dear to me my religion. Still my heart is so sad that I wish myself back in old England. You will say it is wrong, but I cannot help it. I almost wish myself back in old England. I feel so lonely and wretched. Thereupon answered the youth, Indeed I do not condemn you. Stouter hearts than a woman's have quailed in this terrible winter. Yours is tender and trusting, and needs a stronger to lean on. 
so i have come to you now with an offer and proffer of marriage made by a good man and true miles standish the captain of plymouth thus he delivered his message the dexterous writer of letters did not embellish the theme nor array it in beautiful phrases but came straight to the point and blurted it out like a schoolboy even the captain himself could hardly have said it more bluntly mute with amazement and sorrow priscilla the puritan maiden looked into alden's face her eyes dilated with wonder feeling his words like a blow that stunned her and rendered her speechless till at length she exclaimed interrupting the ominous silence if the great captain of plymouth is so very eager to wed me why does he not come himself and take the trouble to woo me if i am not worth the wooing i surely am not worth the winning then john alden began explaining and smoothing the matter making it worse as he went by saying the captain was busy had no time for such things such things the words grating harshly fell on the ear of priscilla and swift as a flash she made answer has he no time for such things as you call it before he is married would he be likely to find it or make it after the wedding that is the way with you men you don't understand us you cannot when you have made up your minds after thinking of this one and that one choosing selecting rejecting comparing one with another then you make known your desire with abrupt and sudden avowal and are offended and hurt and indignant perhaps that a woman does not respond at once to a love that she never suspected does not attain at a bound the height to which you have been climbing this is not right nor just for surely a woman's affection is not a thing to be asked for and had for only the asking when one is truly in love one not only says it but shows it had he but waited a while had he only showed that he loved me even this captain of yours who knows at last might have won me old and rough as he is but now it never can happen still john alden went on unheeding the words of priscilla urging the suit of his friend explaining persuading expanding spoke of his courage and skill and of all his battles in flanders how with the people of god he had chosen to suffer affliction how in return for his zeal they had made him captain of plymouth he was a gentleman born could trace his pedigree plainly back to hugh standish of duxbury hall in lancashire england who was the son of ralph and the grandson of thurston de standish heir unto vast estates of which he was basely defrauded still bore the family arms and had for his crest a cock argent combed and wattled gules and all the rest of the blazon he was a man of honour of noble and generous nature though he was rough he was kindly she knew how during the winter he had attended the sick with a hand as gentle as woman's somewhat hasty and hot he could not deny it and headstrong stern as a soldier might be but hearty and placable always not to be laughed at and scorned because he was little of stature for he was great of heart magnanimous courtly courageous any woman in plymouth nay any woman in england might be happy and proud to be called the wife of miles standish but as he warmed and glowed in his simple and eloquent language quite forgetful of self and full of the praise of his rival archly the maiden smiled and with eyes overrunning with laughter said in a tremulous voice why don't you speak for yourself john End of section three of the courtship of miles standish recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio section four of the courtship of miles standish by henry wadsworth longfellow this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Part 4. John Alden. 
Into the open air John Alden, perplexed and bewildered, rushed like a man insane, and wandered alone by the seaside, paced up and down the sands, and bared his head to the east wind, cooling his heated brow and the fire and fever within him. Slowly, as out of the heavens with apocalyptical splendors, sank the city of God in the vision of John the Apostle, so with its cloudy walls of chrysolite, jasper, and sapphire, sank the broad red sun, and over its turrets uplifted, glimmered the golden reed of the angel who measured the city. "'Welcome, O wind of the east!' he exclaimed in his wild exultation. "'Welcome, O wind of the east, from the caves of the misty Atlantic, blowing o'er fields of dulse and measureless meadows of sea-grass, blowing o'er rocky wastes and the grottoes and gardens of ocean. Lay thy cooled, moist hand on my burning forehead, and wrap me close in thy garments of mist, twill lay the fever within me. Like an awakened conscience, the sea was moaning and tossing, beating remorseful and loud the mutable sands of the seashore. Fierce in his soul was the struggle and tumult of passions contending, love triumphant and crowned, and friendship wounded and bleeding, passionate cries of desire, and importunate pleadings of duty. "'Is it my fault,' he said, "'that the maiden has chosen between us? Is it my fault that he failed? My fault that I am the victor?' Then within him there thundered a voice, like the voice of the prophet, It hath displeased the Lord. And he thought of David's transgression, Bathsheba's beautiful face, and his friend in the front of the battle. Shame and confusion of guilt and abasement and self-condemnation overwhelmed him at once, and he cried in the deepest contrition, it hath displeased the Lord, it is the temptation of Satan. Then, uplifting his head, he looked at the sea, and beheld there dimly the shadowy form of the Mayflower, riding at anchor, rocked on the rising tide, and ready to sail on the morrow, heard the voices of men through the mist, the rattle of cordage, thrown on the deck, the shouts of the mate and the sailors, Ay, ay, sir! clear and distinct but not loud in the dripping air of the twilight still for a moment he stood and listened and stared at the vessel then went hurriedly on as one who seeing a phantom stops then quickens his pace and follows the beckoning shadow yes it is plain to me now he murmured the hand of the lord is leading me out of the land of darkness the bondage of error through the sea that shall lift the walls of its waters around me, hiding me, cutting me off from the cruel thoughts that pursue me. Back will I go o'er the ocean, this dreary land will abandon, her whom I may not love, and him whom my heart has offended. Better to be in my grave in the green old churchyard in England, close by my mother's side, and among the dust of my kindred, Better be dead and forgotten than living in shame and dishonor, sacred and safe and unseen in the dark of the narrow chamber, with me my secret shall lie, like a buried jewel that glimmers bright on the hand that is dust, in the chambers of silence and darkness. Yes, as the marriage ring of the great espousal hereafter." Thus, as he spake, he turned in the strength of his strong resolution, leaving behind him the shore, and hurried along in the twilight, through the congenial gloom of the forest, silent and sombre, till he beheld the lights in the seven houses of Plymouth, shining like seven stars in the dusk and mist of the evening. Soon he entered his door, and found the redoubtable captain sitting alone, and absorbed in the martial pages of Caesar fighting some great campaign in Hainault or Brabant or Flanders. "'Long have you been on your errand,' he said, with a cheery demeanour, even as one who is waiting an answer, and fears not the issue. "'Not far off is the house, although the woods are between us, 
but you have lingered so long that while you were going and coming i have fought ten battles and sacked and demolished a city come sit down and in order relate to me all that has happened then john alden spake and related the wondrous adventure from beginning to end minutely just as it happened how he had seen priscilla and how he had sped in his courtship only smoothing a little and softening down her refusal but when he came at length to the words priscilla had spoken words so tender and cruel why don't you speak for yourself john up leaped the captain of plymouth and stamped on the floor till his armour clanged on the wall where it hung with a sound of sinister omen all his pent-up wrath burst forth in a sudden explosion even as a hand-grenade that scatters destruction around it wildly he shouted and loud john alden you have betrayed me me miles standish your friend have supplanted defrauded betrayed me one of my ancestors ran his sword through the heart of wat tyler who shall prevent me from running my own through the heart of a traitor yours is the greater treason for yours is a treason to friendship you who lived under my roof whom i cherished and loved as a brother you who have fed at my board and drunk at my cup to whose keeping i have entrusted my honour my thoughts the most sacred and secret you too brutus ah woe to the name of friendship hereafter brutus was caesar's friend and you were mine but henceforward let there be nothing between us save war and implacable hatred so spake the captain of plymouth and strode about in the chamber chafing and choking with rage like cords were the veins on his temples but in the midst of his anger a man appeared at the doorway bringing in uttermost haste a message of urgent importance rumours of danger and war and hostile incursions of indians straightway the captain paused and without further question or parley took from the nail on the wall his sword with its scabbard of iron buckled the belt round his waist and frowning fiercely departed alden was left alone he heard the clank of the scabbard growing fainter and fainter and dying away in the distance then he arose from his seat and looked forth into the darkness felt the cool air blow on his cheek that was hot with the insult lifted his eyes to the heavens and folding his hands as in childhood prayed in the silence of night to the father who seeth in secret meanwhile the choleric captain strode wrathful away to the council found it already assembled impatiently waiting his coming men in the middle of life austere and grave in deportment only one of them old the hill that was nearest to heaven covered with snow but erect the excellent elder of plymouth god had sifted three kingdoms to find the wheat for this planting then had sifted the wheat as the living seed of a nation so say the chronicles old and such is the faith of the people near them was standing an indian in attitude stern and defiant naked down to the waist and grim and ferocious in aspect while on the table before them was lying unopened a bible ponderous bound in leather brass studded printed in holland and beside it outstretched the skin of a rattlesnake glittered filled like a quiver with arrows a signal and challenge of warfare brought by the indian and speaking with arrowy tongues of defiance this smile standish beheld as he entered and heard them debating what were an answer befitting the hostile message and menace talking of this and of that contriving suggesting objecting one voice only for peace and that was the voice of the elder judging it wise and well that some at least were converted rather than any were slain for this was but christian behaviour then out spake miles standish the stalwart captain of plymouth muttering deep in his throat for his voice was husky with anger what do you mean to make war with milk and the water of roses 
is it to shoot red squirrels you have your howitzer planted there on the roof of the church or is it to shoot red devils truly the only tongue that is understood by a savage must be the tongue of fire that speaks from the mouth of the cannon thereupon answered and said the excellent elder of plymouth somewhat amazed and alarmed at this irreverent language not so thought st paul nor yet the other apostles not from the cannon's mouth were the tongues of fire they spake with but unheeded fell this mild rebuke on the captain who had advanced to the table and thus continued discoursing leave this matter to me for to me by right it pertaineth war is a terrible trade but in the cause that is righteous sweet is the smell of powder and thus i answer the challenge then from the rattlesnake's skin with a sudden contemptuous gesture jerking the indian arrows he filled it with powder and bullets full to the very jaws and handed it back to the savage saying in thundering tones here take it this is your answer silently out of the room then glided the glistening savage bearing the serpent skin and seeming himself like a serpent winding his sinuous way in the dark to the depths of the forest end of section four of the courtship of miles standish Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section 5 of The Courtship of Miles Standish by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Part 5 The Sailing of the Mayflower. Just in the gray of the dawn, as the mists uprose from the meadows there was a stir and a sound in the slumbering village of plymouth clanging and clicking of arms and the order imperative forward given in tones suppressed a tramp of feet and then silence figures ten in the mist marched slowly out of the village standish the stalwart it was with eight of his valorous army led by their indian guide by Hubblemuck, friend of the white men, northward marching to quell the sudden revolt of the savage. Giants they seemed in the mist, or the mighty men of King David. Giants in heart they were, who believed in God and the Bible. I, who believed in the smiting of Midianites and Philistines. Over them gleamed far off the crimson banners of morning. Under them loud on the sands, the serried billows advancing fired along the line and in regular order retreated many a mile had they marched when at length the village of plymouth woke from its sleep and arose intent on its manifold labors sweet was the air and soft and slowly the smoke from the chimneys rose over roofs of thatch and pointed steadily eastward men came forth from the doors and paused and talked of the weather said that the wind had changed and was blowing fair for the mayflower talked of their captain's departure and all the dangers that menaced he being gone the town and what should be done in his absence merrily sang the birds and the tender voices of women consecrated with hymns the common cares of the household out of the sea rose the sun and the billows rejoiced at his coming. Beautiful were his feet on the purple tops of the mountains, beautiful on the sails of the Mayflower riding at anchor, battered and blackened and worn by all the storms of the winter. Loosely against her masts was hanging and flapping her canvas, rent by so many gales, and patched by the hands of the sailors. Suddenly from her side, as the sun rose over the ocean, darted a puff of smoke and floated seaward anon rang loud over field and forest the cannon's roar and the echoes heard and repeated the sound the signal gun of departure ah but with louder echoes replied the hearts of the people meekly and voices subdued the chapter was read from the bible meekly the prayer was begun but ended in fervent entreaty 
Then from their houses in haste came forth the pilgrims of Plymouth, men and women and children, all hurrying down to the seashore, eager with tearful eyes to say farewell to the Mayflower, homeward bound o'er the sea, and leaving them here in the desert. Foremost among them was Alden. All night he had lain without slumber, turning and tossing about in the heat and unrest of his fever. He had beheld Miles Standish, who came back late from the council, stalking into the room, and heard him mutter and murmur. Sometimes it seemed a prayer, and sometimes it sounded like swearing. Once he had come to the bed and stood there a moment in silence. Then he had turned away and said, I will not wake him. Let him sleep on. It is best. For what is the use of more talking? Then he extinguished the light and threw himself down on his pallet, dressed as he was and ready to start at the break of the morning, covered himself with the cloak he had worn in his campaigns in Flanders, slept as a soldier sleeps in his bivouac ready for action but with the dawn he arose in the twilight alden beheld him put on his corslet of steel and all the rest of his armor buckle about his waist his trusty blade of damascus take from the corner his musket and so stride out of the chamber often the heart of the youth had burned and yearned to embrace him Often his lips had essayed to speak, imploring for pardon. All the old friendship came back with its tender and grateful emotions. But his pride overmastered the nobler nature within him. Pride and the sense of his wrong and the burning fire of the insult. So he beheld his friend departing in anger, but spake not, saw him go forth to danger, perhaps to death and he spake not. Then he arose from his bed and heard what the people were saying, joined in the talk at the door with Stephen and Richard and Gilbert, joined in the morning prayer and in the reading of Scripture, and with the others in haste went hurrying down to the seashore, down to the Plymouth Rock that had been to their feet as a doorstep into a world unknown, the cornerstone of a nation. There with his boat was the master, already a little impatient, lest he should lose the tide, or the wind might shift to the eastward. Square-built, hearty and strong, with an odor of ocean about him, speaking with this one and that, and cramming letters and parcels into his pockets capacious, and messages mingled together into his narrow brain, till at last he was wholly bewildered. Nearer the boat stood Alden with one foot placed on the gunwale, one still firm on the rock, and talking at times with the sailors, seated erect on the thwarts, all ready and eager for starting. He too was eager to go, and thus put an end to his anguish, thinking to fly from despair that swifter than keel is or canvas, thinking to drown in the sea the ghost that would rise and pursue him. But as he gazed on the crowd, he beheld the form of Priscilla, standing dejected among them, unconscious of all that was passing. Fixed were her eyes upon his, as if she divined his intention, fixed with a look so sad, so reproachful, imploring, and patient, that with a sudden revulsion his heart recoiled from its purpose, as from the verge of a crag where one step more is destruction. Strange is the heart of man, with its quick, mysterious instincts. Strange is the life of man, and fatal or fated are moments whereupon turn, as on hinges, the gates of the wall adamantine. Here I remain, he exclaimed, as he looked at the heavens above him, thanking the Lord whose breath had scattered the mist and the madness, wherein blind and lost, to death he was staggering headlong. Yonder snow-white cloud that floats in the ether above me seems like a hand that is pointing and beckoning over the ocean. There is another hand that is not so spectral and ghost-like, holding me, drawing me back, and clasping mine for protection. Float, O hand of cloud, and vanish away in the ether. 
roll thyself up like a fist to threaten and daunt me i heed not either your warning or menace or any omen of evil there is no land so sacred no air so pure and so wholesome as is the air she breathes and the soil that is pressed by her footsteps here for her sake will i stay and like an invisible presence hover around her for ever protecting supporting her weakness yes as my foot was the first that stepped on this rock at the landing so with the blessing of god shall it be the last at the leaving meanwhile the master alert but with dignified air and important scanning with watchful eye the tide and the wind and the weather walked about on the sands and the people crowded around him saying a few last words and enforcing his careful remembrance then taking each by the hand as if he were grasping a tiller into the boat he sprang and in haste shoved off to his vessel glad in his heart to get rid of all this worry and flurry glad to be gone from a land of sand and sickness and sorrow short allowance of victual and plenty of nothing but gospel lost in the sound of the oars was the last farewell of the pilgrims o strong hearts and true not one went back in the mayflower no not one looked back who had set his hand to this ploughing soon were heard on board the shouts and songs of the sailors heaving the windlass round and hoisting the ponderous anchor then the yards were braced and all sails set to the west wind blowing steady and strong and the mayflower sailed from the harbour rounded the point of the gurnet and leaving far to the southward island and cape of sand and the field of the first encounter took the wind on her quarter and stood for the open atlantic borne on the send of the sea and the swelling hearts of the pilgrims long in silence they watched the receding sail of the vessel much endeared to them all as something living and human then as if filled with a spirit and wrapped in a vision prophetic bearing his hoary head the excellent elder of plymouth said let us pray and they prayed and thanked the lord and took courage mournfully sobbed the waves at the base of the rock and above them bowed and whispered the wheat on the hill of death and their kindred seemed to awake in their graves and to join in the prayer that they uttered sun illumined and white on the eastern verge of the ocean gleamed the departing sail like a marble slab in a graveyard buried beneath it lay for ever all hope of escaping lo as they turned to depart they saw the form of an indian watching them from the hill but while they spake with each other pointing with outstretched hands and saying look he had vanished so they returned to their homes but alden lingered a little musing alone on the shore and watching the wash of the billows round the base of the rock and the sparkle and flash of the sunshine like the spirit of god moving visibly over the waters end of section five of the courtship of miles standish recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio section six of the courtship of miles standish by henry wadsworth longfellow this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by leonard wilson part six priscilla thus for a while he stood and mused by the shore of the ocean thinking of many things and most of all of priscilla and as if thought had the power to draw to itself like the lodestone whatsoever it touches by subtle laws of its nature lo as he turned to depart priscilla was standing beside him are you so much offended you will not speak to me said she am i so much to blame that yesterday when you were pleading warmly the cause of another my heart impulsive and wayward pleaded your own 
and spake out, forgetful, perhaps, of decorum. Certainly you can forgive me for speaking so frankly, for saying what I ought not to have said, yet now I can never unsay it, for there are moments in life when the heart is so full of emotion that if by chance it be shaken, or into its depths like a pebble drops some careless word, it overflows, and its secret, spilt on the ground like water, can never be gathered together. Yesterday I was shocked when I heard you speak of Miles Standish, praising his virtues, transforming his very defects into virtues, praising his courage and strength, and even his fighting in Flanders, as if by fighting alone you could win the heart of a woman, quite overlooking yourself and the rest in exalting your hero. Therefore I spake as I did, by an irresistible impulse. You will forgive me, I hope, for the sake of the friendship between us, which is too true and too sacred to be so easily broken. Thereupon answered John Alden, the scholar, the friend of Miles Standish, I was not angry with you, with myself alone I was angry, seeing how badly I managed the matter I had in my keeping. No, interrupted the maiden, with answer prompt and decisive, no, you were angry with me for speaking so frankly and freely. It was wrong, I acknowledge, for it is the fate of a woman long to be patient and silent, to wait like a ghost that is speechless, till some questioning voice dissolves the spell of its silence. Hence is the inner life of so many suffering women, sunless and silent and deep, like subterranean rivers, running through caverns of darkness, unheard, unseen, and unfruitful, chafing their channels of stone with endless and profitless murmurs. Thereupon answered John Alden, the young man, the lover of women, Heaven forbid it, Priscilla, and truly they seem to me always more like the beautiful rivers that watered the Garden of Eden, more like the river Euphrates through deserts of Havilah flowing, filling the land with delight and memories sweet of the garden. Ah, by these words I can see, again interrupted the maiden, how very little you prize me or care for what I am saying when from the depths of my heart, in pain and with secret misgiving, frankly I speak to you, asking for sympathy only and kindness, straightway you take up my words that are plain and direct and in earnest, turning them away from their meaning, and answer with flattering phrases. This is not right, is not just, is not true to the best that is in you, for I know and esteem you, and feel that your nature is noble, lifting mine up to a higher, a more ethereal level. Therefore I value your friendship, and feel it perhaps the more keenly if you say aught that implies I am only as one among many, if you make use of those common and complimentary phrases most men think so fine in dealing and speaking with women, but which women reject as insipid, if not as insulting. Mute and amazed was Alden, and listened and looked at Priscilla, thinking he never had seen her more fair, more divine in her beauty. He who but yesterday pleaded so glibly the cause of another, stood there embarrassed and silent, and seeking in vain for an answer. So the maiden went on, and little divined or imagined what was at work in his heart, that made him so awkward and speechless. Let us then be what we are, and speak what we think, and in all things keep ourselves loyal to truth and the sacred professions of friendship. It is no secret, I tell you, nor am I ashamed to declare it. I have liked to be with you, to see you, to speak with you always. So. I was hurt at your words, and a little affronted to hear you urge me to marry your friend, though he were the Captain Miles Standish. For I must tell you the truth. Much more to me is your friendship than all the love he could give, were he twice the hero you think him. 
then she extended her hand and alden who eagerly grasped it felt all the wounds in his heart that were aching and bleeding so sorely healed by the touch of that hand and he said with a voice full of feeling yes we must ever be friends and of all who offer you friendship let me be ever the first the truest the nearest and dearest casting a farewell look at the glimmering sail of the mayflower distant but still in sight and sinking below the horizon homeward together they walked with a strange indefinite feeling that all the rest had departed and left them alone in the desert but as they went through the fields in the blessing and smile of the sunshine lighter grew their hearts and priscilla said very archly now that our terrible captain has gone in pursuit of the indians where he is happier far than he would be at commanding a household you may speak boldly and tell me of all that happened between you when you returned last night and said how ungrateful you found me thereupon answered john alden and told her the whole of the story told her his own despair and the direful wrath of miles standish whereat the maiden smiled and said between laughing and earnest he is a little chimney and heated hot in a moment but as he gently rebuked her and told her how much he had suffered how he had even determined to sail that day in the mayflower and had remained for her sake on hearing the dangers that threatened all her manner was changed and she said with a faltering accent truly i thank you for this how good you have been to me always thus as a pilgrim devout who toward jerusalem journeys taking three steps in advance and one reluctantly backward urged by importunate zeal and withheld by pangs of contrition slowly but steadily onward receding yet ever advancing journeyed this puritan youth to the holy land of his longings urged by the fervor of love and withheld by remorseful misgivings end of section six of the courtship of miles standish recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio section seven of the courtship of miles standish by henry wadsworth longfellow this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Part seven The March of Miles Standish. Meanwhile, the stalwart Miles Standish was marching steadily northward, winding through forest and swamp, and along the trend of the seashore all day long with hardly a halt, the fire of his anger burning and crackling within and the sulphurous odor of powder seeming more sweet to his nostrils than all the scents of the forest silent and moody he went and much he revolved his discomfort he who was used to success and to easy victories always thus to be flouted rejected and laughed to scorn by a maiden thus to be mocked and betrayed by the friend whom most he had trusted ah twas too much to be borne and he fretted and chafed in his armor i alone am to blame he muttered for mine was the folly what has a rough old soldier grown grim and gray in the harness used to the camp and its ways to do with the wooing of maidens twas but a dream let it pass let it vanish like so many others what i thought was a flower is only a weed and is worthless out of my heart will i pluck it and throw it away and henceforward be but a fighter of battles a lover and wooer of dangers thus he revolved in his mind his sorry defeat and discomfort while he was marching by day or lying at night in the forest looking up at the trees and the constellations beyond them after a three days march he came to an indian encampment pitched on the edge of a meadow between the sea and the forest women at work by the tents and the warriors horrid with war-paint seated about a fire and smoking and talking together 
who, when they saw from afar the sudden approach of the white men, saw the flash of the sun on breastplate and sabre and musket, straightway leaped to their feet, and two from among them advancing came to parley with Standish, and offer him furs as a present. Friendship was in their looks, but in their hearts there was hatred. Braves of the tribe were these, and brothers gigantic in stature, huge as Goliath of Gath, or the terrible Og, king of Bashan. One was Pexwat named, and the other was called Watawamat. Round their necks were suspended their knives in scabbards of wampum, two-edged, trenchant knives, with points as sharp as a needle. Other arms had they none, for they were cunning and crafty. "'Welcome, English,' they said. These words they had learned from the traders, touching at times on the coast to barter and chaffer for peltries. Then in their native tongue they began to parley with Standish, through his guide and interpreter, Hobomok, friend of the white man, begging for blankets and knives, but mostly for muskets and powder, kept by the white man, they said, concealed with the plague in his cellars, ready to be let loose and destroy his brother the red man. But when Standish refused, and said he would give them the Bible, suddenly changing their tone, they began to boast and to bluster. Then Watawamat advanced with a stride in front of the other, and with a lofty demeanor thus vauntingly spake to the captain. Now Watawamat can see by the fiery eyes of the captain, angry is he in his heart. But the heart of the brave Watawamat is not afraid at the sight. He was not born of a woman, but on a mountain at night, from an oak tree riven by lightning, forth he sprang at a bound, with all his weapons about him, shouting, Who is there here to fight with the brave Watawamat? Then he unsheathed his knife, and whetting the blade on his left hand, held it aloft, and displayed a woman's face on the handle, saying with bitter expression, and look of sinister meaning, I have another at home with the face of a man on the handle. By and by they shall marry, and there will be plenty of children. Then stood Pax Watforth, self-vaunting, insulting Miles Standish, while with his fingers he petted the knife that hung at his bosom, drawing it half from its sheath and plunging it back, as he muttered, by and by it shall see, it shall eat, aha, but shall speak not. This is the mighty captain the white men have sent to destroy us. He is a little man. Let him go and work with the women. Meanwhile Standish had noted the faces and figures of Indians peeping and creeping about from bush to tree in the forest, feigning to look for game with arrows set on their bowstrings drawing about him still closer and closer the net of their ambush. But undaunted he stood, and dissembled and treated them smoothly, so the old chronicles say that were writ in the days of the fathers. But when he heard their defiance, the boast, the taunt, and the insult, all the hot blood of his race, of Sir Hugh and of Thurston de Standish, boiled and beat in his heart, and swelled in the veins of his temples. Headlong he leaped on the boaster, and snatching his knife from its scabbard, plunged it into his heart. And reeling backward the savage fell with his face to the sky, and a fiend-like fierceness upon it. Straight there arose from the forest the awful sound of the war-whoop, and like a flurry of snow on the whistling wind of December, swift and sudden and keen, came a flight of feathery arrows. Then came a cloud of smoke, and out of the cloud came the lightning, out of the lightning thunder, and death unseen ran before it. Frightened, the savages fled for shelter in swamp and in thicket, hotly pursued and beset. But their sachem, the brave Watawamat fled not. He was dead. Unswerving and swift had a bullet passed through his brain, and he fell with both hands, clutching the green sward, seeming in death to hold back from his foe the land of his fathers. 
There on the flowers of the meadow the warriors lay, and above them, silent with folded arms, stood Habomach, friend of the white man. Smiling at length, he exclaimed to the stalwart captain of Plymouth, Paxawat bragged very loud of his courage, his strength, and his stature, mocked the great captain, and called him a little man. But I see now, big enough have you been to lay him speechless before you. Thus the first battle was fought and won by the stalwart Miles Standish. When the tidings thereof were brought to the village of Plymouth, and as a trophy of war the head of the brave Watawamat scowled from the roof of the fort, which at once was a church and a fortress, all who beheld it rejoiced and praised the Lord and took courage. Only Priscilla averted her face from this spectre of terror, thanking God in her heart that she had not married Miles Standish. Shrinking, fearing almost, lest coming home from his battles, he should lay claim to her hand as the prize and reward of his valor. End of section seven of the courtship of Miles Standish. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Section eight of the courtship of Miles Standish by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Part eight The Spinning Wheel. Month after month passed away, and in autumn the ships of the merchants came with kindred and friends, with cattle and corn for the pilgrims. All in the village was peace. The men were intent on their labors, busy with hewing and building, with garden plot and with merestead, busy with breaking the glebe and mowing the grass in the meadows, searching the sea for its fish and hunting the deer in the forest. All in the village was peace. But at times the rumor of warfare filled the air with alarm and the apprehension of danger. Bravely the stalwart Miles Standish was scouring the land with his forces, waxing valiant in fight and defeating the alien armies, till his name had become a sound of fear to the nations. Anger was still in his heart. But at times the remorse and contrition which in all noble natures succeed the passionate outbreak, came like a rising tide that encounters the rush of a river, staying its current a while, but making it bitter and brackish. Meanwhile Alden, at home, had built him a new habitation, solid, substantial, of timber rough-hewn from the firs of the forest. Wooden barred was the door, and the roof was covered with rushes. Lattice the windows were, and the window-panes were of paper, oiled to admit the light, while wind and rain were excluded. There, too, he dug a well, and around it planted an orchard. Still may be seen to this day some trace of the well and the orchard. Close to the house was the stall, where, safe and secure from annoyance, Raghorn, the snow-white steer that had fallen to Alden's allotment in the division of cattle, might ruminate in the night-time over the pastures he cropped, made fragrant by sweet pennyroyal. Oft when his labor was finished, with eager feet would the dreamer follow the pathway that ran through the woods to the house of Priscilla, led by illusions romantic and subtle deceptions of fancy pleasure disguised as duty, and love in the semblance of friendship. Ever of her he thought when he fashioned the walls of his dwelling. Ever of her he thought when he delved in the soil of his garden. Ever of her he thought when he read in his Bible on Sunday praise of the virtuous woman, as she is described in the Proverbs. How the heart of her husband does safely trust in her always how all the days of her life she will do him good and not evil, how she seeketh the wool and the flax and worketh with gladness, how she layeth her hand to the spindle and holdeth the distaff, 
how she is not afraid of the snow for herself or her household, knowing her household are clothed with the scarlet cloth of her weaving. So as she sat at her wheel one afternoon in the autumn, Alden, who opposite sat, and was watching her dexterous fingers, as if the thread she was spinning were that of his life and his fortune, after a pause in their talk, thus spake to the sound of the spindle. "'Truly, Priscilla,' he said, "'when I see you spinning and spinning, never idle a moment, but thrifty and thoughtful of others, suddenly you are transformed, are visibly changed in a moment. You are no longer Priscilla, but Berta, the beautiful spinner.' Here the light foot on the treadle grew swifter and swifter. The spindle uttered an angry snarl, and the thread snapped short in her fingers, while the impetuous speaker, not heeding the mischief, continued, "'You are the beautiful Berta, the spinner, the queen of Helvetia, she whose story I read at a stall in the streets of Southampton, who, as she rode on her palfrey, o'er valley and meadow and mountain, ever was spinning her thread from a distaff fixed to her saddle. She was so thrifty and good that her name passed into a proverb. So shall it be with your own, when the spinning wheel shall no longer hum in the house of the farmer, and fill its chambers with music. Then shall the mothers, reproving, relate how it was in their childhood, praising the good old times and the days of Priscilla the spinner. Straight up rose from her wheel the beautiful Puritan maiden, pleased with the praise of her thrift from him whose praise was the sweetest, drew from the reel on the table a snowy skein of her spinning, thus making answer, meanwhile, to the flattering phrases of Alden. Come, you must not be idle. If I am a pattern for housewives, show yourself equally worthy of being the model of husbands. Hold this skein on your hands while I wind it, ready for knitting. Then, who knows but hereafter, when fashions have changed and the manners, fathers may talk to their sons of the good old times of John Alden. Thus, with a jest and a laugh, the skein on his hands she adjusted, he sitting awkwardly there, with his arms extended before him she standing graceful, erect, and winding the thread from his fingers, sometimes chiding a little his clumsy manner of holding, sometimes touching his hands, as she disentangled expertly twist or knot in the yarn, unawares, for how could she help it, sending electrical thrills through every nerve in his body, Lo, in the midst of this scene, a breathless messenger entered, bringing in hurry and heat the terrible news from the village. Yes, Miles Standish was dead. An Indian had brought them the tidings, slain by a poisoned arrow, shot down in the front of the battle, into an ambush beguiled, cut off with the whole of his forces. All the town would be burned, and all the people be murdered. Such were the tidings of evil that burst on the hearts of the hearers. Silent and statue-like stood Priscilla, her face looking backward still at the face of the speaker, her arms uplifted in horror. But John Alden, upstarting, as if the barb of the arrow piercing the heart of his friend, had struck his own, and had sundered once and forever the bonds that held him bound as a captive wild with excess of sensation the awful delight of his freedom mingled with pain and regret unconscious of what he was doing clasped almost with a groan the motionless form of priscilla pressing her close to his heart as for ever his own and exclaiming those whom the lord hath united let no man put them asunder even as rivulets twain from distant and separate sources, seeing each other afar as they leap from the rocks, and pursuing each one its devious path, but drawing nearer and nearer, rush together at last at their trysting place in the forest. So these lives, that had run thus far in separate channels, 
coming in sight of each other, then swerving and flowing asunder, parted by barriers strong, but drawing nearer and nearer, rushed together at last, and one was lost in the other. End of section 8 of The Courtship of Miles Standish Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Section 9 of The Courtship of Miles Standish by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leonard Wilson Part 9 The Wedding Day Forth from the curtain of clouds, from the tent of purple and scarlet, issued the sun, the great high priest, in his garments resplendent, holiness unto the Lord in letters of light on his forehead, round the hem of his robe the golden bells and pomegranates. Blessing the world he came, and the bars of vapour beneath him gleamed like a grate of brass, and the sea at his feet was a laver, this was the wedding morn of priscilla the puritan maiden friends were assembled together the elder and magistrate also graced the scene with their presence and stood like the law and the gospel one with the sanction of earth and one with the blessing of heaven simple and brief was the wedding as that of ruth and of boaz softly the youth and the maiden repeated the words of betrothal taking each other for husband and wife in the magistrate's presence, after the Puritan way and the laudable custom of Holland. Fervently then and devoutly the excellent elder of Plymouth prayed for the hearth and the home that were founded that day in affection, speaking of life and of death, and imploring divine benedictions. Lo, when the service was ended, a form appeared on the threshold, clad in armor of steel, a somber and sorrowful figure. Why does the bridegroom start and stare at the strange apparition? Why does the bride turn pale and hide her face on his shoulder? Is it a phantom of air, a bodiless spectral illusion? Is it a ghost from the grave that has come to forbid the betrothal? Long had it stood there unseen, a guest uninvited, unwelcomed. Over its clouded eyes there had passed at times an expression softening the gloom and revealing the warm heart hidden beneath them, as when across the sky the driving rack of the rain-cloud grows for a moment thin and betrays the sun by its brightness. Once it had lifted its hand and moved its lips, but was silent as if an iron will had mastered the fleeting intention. But when were ended the troth and the prayer and the last benediction, into the room it strode, and the people beheld with amazement bodily there in his armor Miles Standish, the captain of Plymouth. Grasping the bridegroom's hand, he said with emotion, Forgive me, I have been angry and hurt. Too long have I cherished the feeling. I have been cruel and hard, but now, thank God, it is ended. Mine is the same hot blood that leaped in the veins of Hugh Standish, sensitive, swift to resent, but as swift in atoning for error. Never so much as now was Miles Standish the friend of John Alden. Thereupon answered the bridegroom, Let all be forgotten between us, all save the dear old friendship, and that shall grow older and dearer. Then the captain advanced, and bowing, saluted Priscilla gravely, and after the manner of old-fashioned gentry in England, something of camp and of court, of town and of country, commingled, wishing her joy of her wedding, and loudly lauding her husband. Then he said with a smile, I should have remembered the adage, If you would be well served, you must serve yourself. And, moreover, 
"'No man can gather cherries in Kent at the season of Christmas.' Great was the people's amazement, and greater yet their rejoicing, thus to behold once more the sunburnt face of their captain, whom they had mourned as dead. And they gathered and crowded about him, eager to see him and hear him, forgetful of bride and of bridegroom. Questioning, answering, laughing, and each interrupting the other, till the good captain declared, being quite overpowered and bewildered, he had rather by far break into an Indian encampment than come again to a wedding to which he had not been invited. Meanwhile the bridegroom went forth and stood with the bride at the doorway, breathing the perfumed air of that warm and beautiful morning. Touched with autumnal tents, but lonely and sad in the sunshine, lay extended before them the land of toil and privation. There were the graves of the dead, and the barren waste of the seashore. There the familiar fields, the groves of pine, and the meadows. But to their eyes transfigured, it seemed as the garden of Eden, filled with the presence of God, whose voice was the sound of the ocean. Soon was their vision disturbed by the noise and stir of departure, friends coming forth from the house, and impatient of longer delaying, each with his plan for the day, and the work that was left uncompleted. Then from a stall near at hand, amid exclamations of wonder, Alden the thoughtful, the careful, so happy, so proud of Priscilla, brought out his snow-white steer, obeying the hand of its master, led by a cord that was tied to an iron ring in its nostrils, covered with crimson cloth and a cushion placed for a saddle. She should not walk, he said, through the dust and heat of the noonday. Nay, she should ride like a queen, not plod along like a peasant. Somewhat alarmed at first, but reassured by the others, placing her hand on the cushion, her foot in the hand of her husband, gaily, with joyous laugh, Priscilla mounted her palfrey. Nothing is wanting now, he said with a smile, but the distaff. Then you would be in truth my queen, my beautiful Berta. Onward the bridal procession now moved to their new habitation, happy husband and wife, and friends conversing together. Pleasantly murmured the brook as they crossed the ford in the forest, pleased with the image that passed like a dream of love through its bosom, tremulous, floating in air, or the depths of the azure abysses. Down through the golden leaves the sun was pouring his splendors, gleaming on purple grapes that from branches above them suspended mingled their odorous breath with the balm of the pine and the fir-tree, wild and sweet as the clusters that grew in the valley of Eshkol. Like a picture, it seemed, of the primitive pastoral ages, fresh with the youth of the world, and recalling Rebecca and Isaac, old and yet ever new, and simple and beautiful always, love immortal and young in the endless succession of lovers. So through the Plymouth woods passed onward the bridal procession. End of section 9, and also the end of The Courtship of Miles Standish by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio.